Hello. As you know, vomiting is one of the most commonest symptoms in children and accompanies most acute childhood illness. So, in this lesson, I will discuss about approach to the vomiting child. As you know, vomiting is a forceful expulsion of the stomach contents through the mouth via contraction of the abdominal and the chest wall muscles. An emetic response may be triggered by irritation of the gastric mucosa by toxins, drugs, or overdistension, which stimulates vagal afferents to the vomiting center in the brain. Afferent impulses from other areas of the brain, such as the vestibular system and the amygdala, or from certain organs outside the GI tract, can stimulate vomiting in a similar mechanism. Stimulation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the area post trima of the fourth ventricle by toxins, electrolyte or metabolic disturbance or increased ICP also results in vomiting through activation of the vomiting center. Since vomiting is a common pediatric presentation, the differential is extremely broad. While GI causes tend to come to mind first, there are many non-GI causes for vomiting that have to be considered. The cause for pediatric vomiting can be broken into categories including gastrointestinal causes, infectious, neurologic causes, metabolic endocrine causes, respiratory, toxin or medication related, and the psychogenic or behavioral causes. When we face a vomiting child in our OPD, taking a complete vomiting history will thoroughly investigate the history of presenting illness. As with many standard complaints, the onset, frequency, time frame, provoking and elevating factors should be explored. The vomit should be characterized in detail including the amount, color and the consistency. First, it should be categorized as bilious or non-bilious. Bilious vomit has a greenish appearance due to the presence of bile. This is indicative of obstructing distal to the ampulla of water, which is the opening of the comb bile duct into the duodenum. Thus, determining whether vomit is bilious or non-bilious helps to localize GI problems within the GI tract. The second is, the vomiting should be categorized as bloody or non-bloody. Bloody in the vomit indicates inflammation or damage to the GI mucosa and may indicate need for endoscopy to rule out acute upper GI bleeding. The third is, the vomit should be identified as projectile or non-projectile. A projectile vomiting may point to specific diagnosis, for example, pyloric stenosis. True expulsive vomiting should be distinguished from regurgitation, which is not associated with stretching or prodoma features like nausea, sweating, and tachycardia. So, regurgitation do not have prodromal features like nausea, tachycardia, or stretching, while vomiting do have those things. The fourth is, the age of the presentation should be considered. The most common cause of vomiting in the neonatal period include gastroenteritis, malrotation, pyloric stenosis, tracheoesophageal fistula, and necrotizing enterocolitis. But there are also other causes for vomiting in children. In infancy, common causes are gastroesophageal reflex disease, gastroenteritis, bowel obstruction, milk protein allergy, or UTI, or uh, any other thing. In children, one must think of gastroenteritis, DK, UTI, postusive vomiting may be due to pertussis, increased intracranial pressure, and in adolescents, gastroenteritis, appendicitis, DK, and increased intracranial pressure are also the differential. The fifth one is one should determine whether the child is febrile or afebrile. The presence of fever. This vomit increases the likelihood of an infectious etiology. One should also ask about the presence of any associated GI symptoms, such as nausea, abdominal pain, distension, diarrhea, and obstipation. Infectious symptoms should be listed, including fever, dysuria, ear pain, cough, horiza, shortness of breath, and meningismus. And other important associated symptoms to ask about are headache, change in vision, polyuria, polydipsia weight loose, just to rule out increased interacranial pressure or decay. Finally, it is very important to elucidate the child's hydration status. 
So one should always ask about oral intake during output tear production and the way it changes when we face a vomiting child. On physical examination, as with any physical exam, begins with an assessment of the patient's vital sign and ask yourself, is this child well or unwell? The initial management and the investigation of stable versus unstable child can be quite different. The physical exam should then begin with an assessment of hydration status. The examiner should assess the fontanelles, skin target, mucous membrane, look for objective measurements of stool and the urine output. A rough abdominal exam should be performed. So look for abdominal distension, mass or visible peristalsis on inspection. Auscultation should be done to look for hyperactive or absent bowel sound. Palpation should be done to assess for tenderness and the feel for mice or organomegaly. In older children, special tests to assess for appendicitis or cholestites can be performed. In addition, a neurologic exam should also be done to rule out signs of increased interacranial pressure, examination of cranial nerves, and examination for evidence of CNS infection. Lastly, particular neonates and infants, the presence of dysmorphic features, ambiguous genitalia, or possibility of congenital adrenal hyperplasia or unusual odors for metabolic syndrome should be noted as they might point to underlying congenital or metabolic causes. Investigation should also be based on the history and the age of the patient. For instance, a three months old with vomiting, fever and the lethargy is at high risk of sepsis, so this child should receive a full septic workup. An older child with three of clearly suggestive of AG likely not require any investigation. And also based on history and the physical examination, we can also do CBC with differentials, electrolyte, organ function test, random blood sugar, imaging like abdominal ultrasound, CT, endoscopy, and brain imaging. Treatment of pediatric vomiting depends on correction of underlying causes. Symptomatic relief for gastroenteritis can be achieved through the use of antimatic agents in infants and the children 6 months of age and older with ondacetron. All children with vomiting should be assessed and treated for dehydration and electrolyte disturbance. Mild dehydration can be treated with encouragement of oral fluids and moderate to severe dehydration should be treated with IV fluids. This is all about approach to a child with vomiting. Thank you for watching.